Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Andre Marinica. I am a core developer at Elron Network. Uh, we are trying to be the internet scale blockchain, highly scalable, uh, highly accessible to everyone. And um, thank, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, today, I would like to share with all of you uh, the story of Elrond and especially the story of our VM, uh, how we got from having basically nothing two years ago to having a functional VM and a, on a functional blockchain that we used to run a lot of smart contracts on, and hopefully even more in the future. Um, so with that, I will begin. This is the Elrond WebAssembly story. Um, I will talk about four main things. Uh, I will first give um, an overview of what Elrond is and uh, what we do at Elrond. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about how uh, our, our, our smart contract architecture is, uh, how we think of smart contracts and um, from a very, very high level perspective. And then I will go dive a little bit deeper into how we execute them and how we really integrated the WebAssembly into our stack. And of course, uh, the last thing, I'll have a really short slide, but very, very important about how we verify the correctness of what we build and what our developers build. So without further ado, uh, what is Elrond? Um, Elrond is a very, very scalable layer one blockchain protocol, uh, which many of you might have heard of. Uh, we do state charting and proof of stake. Um, we manage to scale uh, in a test net, we managed over 200,000 transactions per second, but that's not the most important part. The most important part is that we can technically scale indefinitely with demand. We have a six sec second latency block and very, very cheap transactions. Uh, but even more important than that, uh, we have uh, the DeFi, um, Iron's Money and DeFi uh, app, which is called Mayar, uh, which uh, is, um, uh, is, a phone, is a smartphone application that allows... Uh, anybody uh, with a smartphone access to the world of DeFi and the world of crypto. And uh, so far it's been having quite some success. And last but not least, uh, we have quite some interesting uh, token economics, uh, our token eGold. I won't go into very much detail about it, but I'll just mention on the fly that uh, it, it has a limited supply and a very interesting um, minting and burning model. Uh, there's more on our website. This presentation isn't about it, so I'll just move on. Right. Our main innovations. Um, there's a few pillars uh, that make Elrond what it is and that brought us where we are today. The most important one is adaptive state sharding. It's uh, our flavor of proof of stake sharding. Uh, there are three types of, uh, of uh, blockchain sharding, and we do all, all three of them. One is a state. So each shard has completely separate state from the other. Uh, the other one is transactions. So each shard processes its own transactions independent of the others. And yeah, what, the, the third one is network sharding in which uh, the, the networks in, themselves don't communicate too much uh, so as to optimize um, uh, the throughput. Uh, currently we have one meta chain and three uh, execution shards, but in principle we can, um, we can have more of those if there is demand or fewer, you know, as, as, as the uh, demand fluctuates, we can adapt our number of shards. Uh, then the second pillar is secure proof of stake. This is, again, this is a special flavor of uh, proof of stake. It's based on a Byzantine fault tolerance, like a consensus mechanism, which samples a consensus group with um, every round. Uh, and uh, we have validators randomly shuffled between shards so that uh, shard takeovers are very difficult. And we also have an unbiasable randomness source, which uh, can be very useful for certain types of contracts. Um, then we have smart accounts. Um, now, smart accounts, basically any account on Elrond is a smart account. Uh, user accounts and smart contracts are not that different in that they both have an individual data tree where there's storage. Now, of course, a user cannot write anything they want in their own storage, but uh, this storage can be used by the protocol uh, to enable all kinds of cool uh, functionality. And last but not least, uh, we have a thing called custom tokens. We call it ESDT, that is for Elrond Standard Digital Tokens. Uh, these are native tokens. So unlike uh, what you see on Ethereum or, or similar blockchains uh, where tokens are encoded in an ERC-20 kind of uh, smart contract, so where you know all custom uh, tokens live in a smart contract, we decided to build them directly into the protocol. And this is very cool and very important because it allows us to transfer them very cheaply. 
uh, and uh, and it's a bit easier to work with them cross chart, uh, which I'll get back to later. And uh, of course, they are come in three flavors: fungible, semi fungible, and non fungible, which means we have basically NFTs baked directly into the protocol. Okay, uh, now a little bit about um, how the last uh, two or three years have been. <laughs> um, a few highlights, uh, we've had the mainnet launch uh, a, a little more than a year ago, it was uh, late uh, July. So the mainnet has been online for a year now um, and uh, without interruptions that is, which we are very, very proud of. And also in January, we had our Meyer launch. Uh, Meyer again is our um, smartphone app, which uh, enables anybody to connect to blockchain. And it's very friendly um, and we're preparing, we're in our final preparations to launch uh, our first uh, decentralized exchange uh, on called the Meyer DEX, uh, which will be soon, <laughs> hopefully very soon. Uh, there's more about the roadmap and the projects we do um, on our website. There will be a launch pad. There will be an NFT marketplace, a lot of cool stuff coming, but this is just like the major, major things. Uh, now, I gave you a little bit of an introduction of, of what Eldron is, uh, and now I, I want to really, really start telling the story of uh, how we came about uh, to building our uh, smart contract infrastructure. Um, now, the, main, the first and major uh, obstacle, uh, the major challenge uh, that uh, any smart, uh, any sharded uh, blockchain has is how do you run smart contracts in a sharded architecture? Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the state is completely uh, separate. So each shard has its separate state and it, they're separate transactions, which means contracts cannot communicate directly across shards um, because that, that would you know, contradict the entire concept of sharding. Um, so each user account lives in a shard, each smart contract lives in a shard and they all have their own data trees. And then they rely on the protocol to resolve uh, the cross shard calls. Now. As you can imagine, there's uh, cross shard calls from users to smart contracts, but there's also cross shard calls from smart contracts to other smart contracts. Um, right. So again, shards don't have direct access to each other's state. Uh, so how do we do? Now, there's two ways we go about this. Of course, as a simple way, um, similar to what you have on single sharded um, architectures like Ethereum, uh, we call them synchronous calls in that uh, if, and only if, uh, you know for certain that two contracts are in the same shard, then of course they can interact with each other in a classical way that everybody understands. So uh, a contract A can call a, another contract B in the same shard, um, and the, the two transactions can, ha they happen atomically, and you can get uh, the result uh, instantly, uh, which means you can interrogate, you can do all kinds of stuff. And if one fails, then all of them fail. Uh, but the problem is, of course, this is not scalable. Um, so we usually prefer not doing this. Uh, we do it, but rarely. Uh, what we prefer to do is uh, working with so-called asynchronous calls. Now, these asynchronous calls are shard agnostic, which means the developer doesn't care and shouldn't care and shouldn't even know whether or not the two uh, contracts are in the same shard or not. Remember, I said uh, we have adaptive state sharding. So at some point, the shard might split into two. So we don't even know. Maybe today the contracts are in the same shard, but maybe and then on another day, uh, the contracts end up in two different shards. Uh, so this is why it's important that we have a mechanism that works in both cases identically. It consumes the same amount of gas, even though, of course, doing things cross shard is usually a bit slower. And we also can't have uh, the answer. So if you want to interrogate another contract, which is in another, 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 sorry, in another shard, uh, of course, you can't have your answer immediately because the data is not there. Now, what happens is uh, you create this uh, kind of transaction to the other shard, and then you wait, and maybe one, two more blocks down the line, you will get back the result in what we call a callback transaction. So uh, you get the answer a bit later. And this is not atomic, unfortunately. So uh, the developer has to handle the rollback explicitly in case of failure uh, or commit things that can only be committed uh, when there's confirmation that the other transaction also happened. And I have a nice diagram here. 
Now, this, I have to caution you, is the absolute simplest, um, uh, the absolute simplest uh, cross shard transaction from a smart contract to another smart contract. Of course, there's a lot more complex scenarios that can be had. Uh, but yeah, in, in this most simplest form, uh, you have a user, the user is calling a smart contract. Um, of course, as part of, of, a, of a decentralized application and contract A needs uh, something um, done uh, in contract B, which is perhaps in another shard, perhaps not. So what happens is contract A sends this asynchronous call to contract B um, and then contract B does its thing. And contract B sends uh, the reply back. This happens automatically. So the developer doesn't have to do that. The protocol always sends a callback back. Um, and if uh, contract B uh, ran successfully, then contract A will know this and will get the answer and will be able to commit stuff. Uh, and if contract B failed, then contract A will be notified that, hey, contract B failed and maybe you want to roll back some stuff and so forth. So this is in a nutshell how it works. It's conceptually not very complicated, uh, but you know, as the scenarios become more and more complex, so does um, the system. Now, the second, um, so to say, complication, the second um, innovation uh, is that smart contracts have to interact with EZT tokens. So I mentioned EZT tokens earlier. Uh, they are native, uh, so they're part of the protocol and they get transferred just like the native currency. And their ownership is actually not stored in a smart contract as we're used to from Ethereum and ERC-20, uh, they're actually stored in the individual trees of uh, the uh, users. This is very important in a sharded architecture. Just imagine what would mean uh, to run an ERC-20 in a sharded architecture. You might be in a, in a shard and your token might be in another shard. So it would take a lot of time for you even to do the most basic stuff with your token because you wouldn't have direct access to it. In this way, uh, we make sure that every user has direct access at all times uh, to their tokens because their tokens are in their account. They're not in a smart contract. So this is, again, what uh, we use these individual account trees for, or one of the things. And another very nice thing that we have is uh, we don't need the allowance. Uh, maybe, you know, ERC-20 contracts, have the, you, you need to allow uh, other smart contracts to take your tokens from you before uh, you can interact with them. Uh, because we don't, because we store um, these uh, tokens uh, with the users, um, whenever a user wants to interact with a smart contract, it just sends the contract, its tokens in one single transaction. So there's no need for multiple transactions there, which again is nice because um, it makes interaction with, uh, with uh, the decentralized application world a bit easier. Now, of course, they're fungible and there's also semi-fungible and non-fungible. Um, and these guys, uh, non-fungible and se se uh, semi-fungible ones, they carry additional information, uh, which again, I'll come back to a bit later. Uh, and another cool thing that we've had for a month or two is uh, we can transfer multiple tokens at once. So in the same transaction, you can actually um, send multiple tokens, uh, which is cool from user to user, but it's especially cool if you want to interact uh, with, a, for instance, so with a decentralized exchange where you might want to swap two tokens, so you might want to send them both at once, and then you get two tokens in return. Uh, right, so as I mentioned, smart contracts can receive and they can send ESDT tokens too. Um, and another nice quirk about this, uh, especially in the, in the sharded context, is the fact that um, because these tokens uh, can hold data, um, they can also be used as a form of alternative storage. And now, of course, any smart contract has its own storage and they can keep that storage and it's there indefinitely in their own shard, in their own uh, account tree. But uh, let's say you run um, a multitude of uh, smart contracts that communicate with each other across shards and you wanna share some information between them. Another way you can share information between them, you can have them exchange these tokens, which might not be valuable. They might be, you know, they might not be, you know, the kind of tokens that, I don't know, you would collect uh, like NFTs or keep. It might just be pieces of information that travels from one shard to the other, from one contract to the other, and they help synchronize the state of a more complex DAP. And this is actually something that we're very actively researching. How do we uh, split uh, DAPs into multiple shards, multiple contracts, 
so that people don't have to interact with a monolithic uh, smart contract in one shard, but that they they can have their own um, their own smart contract in their own shard. So everything goes a bit faster. Right now, I will go a little bit deeper. So this was a an overview of the main challenges of the main uh, things we had to to deal with. And now I'll go a little bit deeper uh, into how we execute smart contracts. This is where it gets maybe a little more technical, but don't be scared. I'll try to explain everything in plain terms too. Uh, so first things first, um, from the get-go, we thought how cool it would be to have more than one VM. Um, so what we did was we built a VM adapter, uh, which allows plugging in any number of VMs, uh, basically any piece of software that uh, you know satisfies the um, that um, um, interface can be a VM, but of course, VMs are not plug and play things. They're part of the consensus. So uh, you need a, a system-wide upgrade to change uh, the available VMs. However, this is possible. And even though right now we only have one VM, uh, it's called uh, R1, is the L1 VM. Um, it has multiple versions. Uh, we had to do this uh, to mitigate some of uh, the backwards compatibility issues uh, that we either had or might have had. Uh, so currently we use it uh, for, um, yeah, it's a form of versioning uh, so that older contracts can still run even if we change uh, some, of the, um, some of the VM characteristics. And of course, each smart contract uh, points to its own VM. So each smart contract knows which VM it runs on. Uh, so it has a specific VM and VM version uh, somewhere on the blockchain stored into it. But enough of that, let's dive right in into the Ldron VM, the R1 VM. Uh, so uh, the story of this uh, started actually in 2019. Um, we had some attempts to port a, thing, a, a VM called the Yele VM to Elrond. Uh, this is a formally specified uh, dialect of LLVM, which is very cool. Uh, and we actually got it to work uh, on the first testnet. We had a prototype of it, and uh, we actually had a very, very cool game, which is called was called Crypto Bubbles. Uh, it was very addictive and uh, made us um, spend a lot of time instead of working playing the game. Uh, I will admit that. Um, unfortunately, it's not online. It's not live anymore. Um, but the main, uh, but yeah, may maybe we'll maybe we'll revive it at some point in the future. Who knows if there's enough uh, demand for it? Uh, the only problem was this Yale VM. As cool as it was, it was kind of slow. It was interpreter based. Uh, we couldn't get to you, we couldn't get it uh, to run more than a couple dozen transactions in a block, uh, which was of a not very complex um, smart contract. So we figured it will be very very difficult to scale like that. Uh, so sometime uh, late 2019, uh, we switched to WebAssembly um, and um, specifically to Wasmer. Uh, now, we're at the WebAssembly conference, so everybody knows what WebAssembly is. Uh, we chose uh, Wasmer uh, and WebAssembly especially because it's very portable and it's very fast. And we tried to get it to be as fast as possible. We use single pass just in time compilation. So uh, our contracts are stored as uh, WebAssembly binaries on the blockchain. Uh, whenever uh, we have a transaction to a smart contract, it gets compiled. Um, we get, um, we also get the local caching of uh, smart contract binaries. Since this compilation, this just in time compilation can, uh, can take quite a little bit of time. Uh, so we try to optimize this uh, like this. Um, we have uh, configurable per opcode metering. Uh, we used a prototype actually. Uh, and what we're running on is actually a fork of Wasmer that has a few uh, small modifications that we needed. And we also use uh, runtime breakpoints, uh, which we use um, you know, to get out with panics and stuff like that. Um, uh, right. Another very important feature of it, it's uh, the, uh, the smart contracts run in a stateless sandbox. So uh, they actually don't communicate directly with the blockchain. Of course, they can ask uh, data from the protocol, uh, like, you know, what's the current block, um, stuff like that. Uh, but uh, the results are never committed to the blockchain until the um, execution has finished successfully, uh, which, again, helps a lot with uh, reliability. Uh, and it also makes it a bit faster because it doesn't have to uh, have such, such long-reaching long communications uh, within it. Now, this is um, 
this is the uh, the sandwich, uh, our tech sandwich, very, very simplified. So there on the bottom, you have the Elrond Go node. Uh, that is basically the main piece of software of the blockchain. That is the protocol. Uh, it does all the magic. Um, it makes the blockchain exist. On top of it, we have the adapter that we talked about. Uh, this adapter um, allows uh, connecting uh, various uh, VMs, which we have, I think, yeah, one or two, as I mentioned before. Um, on top, we have our Elrond VM, which is called R1. And this uh, VM is, you know, the main focus of my talk, actually. Uh, it runs uh, an instance of Wasmer in it. And uh, also it has something very interesting, which I'm going to uh, dive a little bit deeper in the following few slides, which is called smart contract primitives, which is uh, we offer some sort of standard library to smart contracts. And I'll explain in a moment why. And we also have a lot of execution contexts. Uh, these are all kinds of stuff like uh, managing state, uh, managing inputs, managing outputs, managing errors, and also very importantly, managing these um, these calls between contracts, with, which can be asynchronous or synchronous. So there's a lot of magic, actually. There's a lot of code in it to ensure that uh, correct communication between the shards, between the contracts can happen. On top of that, uh, we have our um, smart contracts uh, and smart contracts of course they are web assembly contracts so whenever we commit something to the uh, blockchain we commit a web assembly binary that's it but of course we don't want to write uh, directly a web assembly by hand although it, it is possible and it's okay to write but you know for your everyday um, developers you want you want to have a nice high level language built on it and the language that we've invested most in is rust we have a, a Rust framework that we've been working on for a year and a half or two, I think, um, which offers all kinds of features. Uh, you will see uh, a small screenshot of it. We also offer uh, very minimal uh, C and C++ frameworks. Uh, now you can write smart contracts for L1 in C and C++. We actually do it all the time, but we mostly do it for testing to test our own framework. Uh, and not so much for general contract development. For that, we recommend Rust. Of course, in the future, we plan on expanding this list of languages, but yeah, that takes time and it just made more sense to focus on one uh, for now. Now, uh, this is again, a little bit more, te more technical, but I think it's interesting how Arwen and Wasmer uh, interact, uh, how the integration between the two works. So here on the... Um, here on the left, uh, you have the node, the, the blockchain. This feeds uh, inputs into the, uh, into the um, uh, VM. Th these inputs, uh, they are basically transactions that the users send to the blockchain. Um, now, then Arvin takes these um, inputs uh, and it can do one of two things. Uh, if it's a new contract, it doesn't know anything about, it will just send uh, the WASM contract bytecode to a single pass streaming compiler. This compiler will create an executable and the executable will be run. Uh, now, if R1 has seen this contract before, it loads it from the cache. So it goes faster than like this. Um, and then the executable will run the smart contract. It also in, uh, has um, metering injected into it. And uh, then the contract has access uh, to an um, environment uh, it's um, the um, environment interface, uh, which where we provide a multitude of methods that contracts can use to interact with the blockchain, like uh, give me the arguments, uh, this, these are my results, uh, load something from storage, write something to storage, etc. We have we have loads of those. Okay, and now I will go a bit deeper into what these kind of uh, primitive, what this kind of um, uh, this EI. Uh, is uh, for a smart contract. We actually provide a, quite a comprehensive uh, library basically baked into the VM. Uh, and the reason for this is uh, we figured very soon along the way that uh, smart contract size is critical. Uh, and it's critical for two reasons. Now, of course, we, don't, we want to have as little data as we can in the blockchain. And of course, every smart contract is stored on the blockchain. So if we have a very big contract, this will inflate a lot the size of our blockchain, which we don't want because we, we want people to be able to run nodes on, on uh, machines that are as small as possible, uh, make, make it as accessible to, to everyone. 
But there's another side to it. Uh, it's the fact that um, a lot of the times you have to compile uh, these um, these uh, Wasm um, uh, bytecodes to machine code. And this takes time. Uh, for, a, for a big contract, it might be 80 or 90% of your transactions. We don't want that. You want small, very, very small contracts. So the compilation is fast. Even with caching, you still want it to be as fast as possible. Uh, so we, uh, we made ourselves this goal of having very, very small smart contracts, uh, no larger than a few kilobytes inside size. Uh, which we're every day struggling uh, to get better at. Uh, we started, for instance, with certain contracts had 100 kilobytes and we reduced them to maybe um, 30 or 40. We have also uh, a few contracts that are smaller than one kilobyte inside. Uh, we have an ERC20, which we use for benchmarking, which we managed to reduce down to 3.5 kilobytes inside, which is very, very small. Um, but how, how were we able to achieve this? And this comes, here comes a trick that we use. Uh, now you could think of it as a pre-compile, although it's more like something baked directly into the, um, uh, into the framework. Um, we have these mathematical and crypto operations that we offer uh, for smart contracts to use directly from the VM. Uh, now for crypto, it's, it's pretty easy to understand. So um, um, a contract needs to call a crypto function. It just called it from the VM. The VM gives out the result. But we did this uh, for more for more than just crypto. We did it for mathematics too. Uh, so we have these kind of managed types, uh, which mean that uh, the VM actually keeps uh, some data during the execution of a smart contract. And this data is usually large types that we don't would normally want to handle uh, in the byte uh, in the Wasm bytecode. Uh, so think of it as a sort of standard library. Um, the idea is that we want smart contracts to only contain the business logic, uh, very, very minimal, uh, only the how, only the what and not the how. And let the VM do everything else uh, and in a very optimized manner. Uh, so how it works is the VM has this kind of heap, is a structure. Uh, where you have a handle, and with a handle, you get access to a number or a string of bytes. Uh, so uh, the was memory doesn't have to hold them. And these types are as follows. So our first uh, type that we played around with was big int. Now, of course, smart contracts work with, um, with balances, for instance. And uh, on Elrond, the balances uh, are not floating points, okay? Because you want you want a comma, you want a decimal, but we don't use floating point because it would be too unstable. We use fixed point, and uh, so basically, every time you send one eagle to somebody else uh, in the blockchain, you're actually sending a one followed by eighteen zeros of you know the most the smallest unit, which is I don't know a tiny eagle way or something. Um, so. From the get-go, the, even the most simple contracts um, need to work with really big numbers. Um, so we thought, why not just bake a big end library directly into the VM since it's so fundamental to uh, running all contracts, which we did. Uh, now, there's another difference that uh, is between EVM and what we did. EVM usually uh, works a lot with 256-bit numbers. Problem is from time to time, these overflow not often, but sometimes they overflow. And with big int, you don't have, you don't run that risk basically, uh, which made our life easier and helped us sleep at night a bit better. Uh, but yeah, again, baking a uh, big int into each and every wasm would have inflated them a lot. Uh, and it wouldn't have been so much worth it since everybody needs it anyway. Uh, and a few months ago, we also added a more general version of it, which are called managed buffers, which is just random strings of bytes. We use we use them for all kinds of stuff to concatenate like error messages to uh, concatenate keys for storage everything we do with them we also have an elliptic curve object which we use for cryptography and we're developing a big float uh, so yeah maybe in a month or two if everything goes well uh, there will be access to uh, big floats too in uh, smart contracts and I'll just go over on a very very simple example. Uh, of how a smart contract would work with this. Um, this is actually what happens every day on our blockchain. Uh, so these numbers don't actually ever get loaded in Wasm. The contract not, does ne never see them. It just tells the VM, hey, do this with these numbers. So uh, this is a very simple example from a very simple contract. It's called an adder contract. It just 
has in storage a value and then you can increment it. That's it. Very, very simple. Uh, but this value is a big int. So how would you go about it? Uh, the contract basically asks uh, at the very beginning, uh, the framework, hey, I'm expecting one argument and this should be a big int. Uh, just load this argument for me. And then the VM says, sure, okay. And here's your handle for it. This is handle zero. And the contract never sees the number, just get the handle. Then, okay, I have this value in storage. Let's read this. And then the VM gives it the other value at handle one. And the contract says, okay, sure. Just add these two numbers together. And uh, okay, the VM adds them behind the scenes and says, okay, so I'll put the result in handle two. And then the contract says, save this to storage and maybe also return this. And you have a very, very small transaction, a small function that got executed. Uh, you managed to interact with a storage. You managed to receive um, uh, arguments. You managed to deserialize them. You didn't have to worry about deserializing them or serializing them back. And you, during this entire time, the contract didn't see the numbers even once. It only told the VM what to do with them. So this is how we get really, really small, um, really, really small contracts. Uh, okay, uh, now here's some benchmarks. Uh, the latest one is the ERC-20 benchmark. Now, again, we don't have ERC-20s, but we use the ERC kind of um, uh, smart contract uh, for benchmark because it's so standard, because everybody knows how it looks like and what it does. Uh, so we managed to shrink it down to 3.5 kilobytes in size and uh, half, a half a millisecond per transfer. It's pretty fast. Uh, there will be more benchmarks. Uh, in the picture, we have a bit of an uh, older comparison, uh, but actually the error numbers, uh, we, we checked them this month. So the error numbers are fresh. Uh, we don't know so much about the other ones, if they've changed or improved a lot. Um, I don't know if we're the fastest or in the top, but I presume we're in the top. Um, there's, I hope that at some point we will have a more comprehensive um, array of benchmarks that everybody can do and so we can compare with each other but and that's not necessarily the point the point is that it's fast and that it works so there it goes um, now you might ask yourself uh, okay but with all these managed numbers wouldn't be isn't it very cumbersome to write um, uh, to write smart contracts because you have to um, you know work with these types which are not even in memory uh, and the answer is, well, you, yeah, it's not a problem because uh, we have high level languages nowadays, which are very powerful and can hide this complexity from you. And I'm talking about Rust. Um, I have a lot of praise to say for Rust because it is a very high level language, which uh, allows you to express very high level abstractions. But at the same time, uh, it gives you a lot of capabilities uh, to perform a very, very low level, very intense optimizations. So it's, it's pretty amazing at that. Uh, and we tried to use it as much as we could, to use its magic as much as we could. And here we see an example of the example I, of, of the smart contract I talked about earlier, uh, the one with a uh, number there, uh, which you can increment. And as you can see, uh, nowhere do you have to specify or you have to think of the fact that this, this uh, big int um, ver type is actually not in memory, it's somewhere else. Uh, and you can even write, have operators on it, like run like uh, plus equals stuff like that. And you don't care. Uh, in this whole example, you basically have deserialization of a big number. You have reading from storage, you have writing to storage, uh, but you don't actually have to worry about it very much because uh, the framework does a lot for you. And actually the um, most of the work that the framework does is, is at compile time, which means, um, the actual smart contract output is small and very fast. And we're closing, we're, we're closing the, uh, the end uh, and it wouldn't be complete this presentation without talking a little bit about how we verify smart contracts, how we make sure that our infrastructure works okay and how we verify that uh, the contracts that developers build and that we also build uh, run fine. And, you know, Blockchain security and smart contract security is a thorny topic to say the least. There's a lot of money being lost every week uh, to, so to software bugs. So we're not taking this lightly, quite the opposite. Uh, we've built an entire stack of tools that we use. Um, now, of course, first of all, we 
we did uh, some high level stuff. So there's a component which is in Rust only that mocks everything, mocks the VM, mocks everything. Uh, but you can write uh, unit tests and you can write integration tests in high level Rust. And the cool thing is you get a debugger and you can get some high level coverage, uh, which we were, we didn't yet manage to, to do uh, running, running the web assembly. So everything you see, uh, in the, in, on the, at the first point that is not involving WebAssembly, so with everything mocked. Um, then the most important tool that we use uh, for testing smart contracts is called Mandos. Uh, Mandos is a, a JSON format. Uh, it's uh, You express basically in a, a JSON kind of way uh, scenarios. Uh, so this is the blockchain. These are the contracts. These are the transactions, and these are the outputs that you expect. This is maybe the storage that you would expect after a transaction has happened. Um, yeah, by the way, in case you're wondering, Mandos is um, some character, some, some very um, little known character from Lord of the Rings. But anyway, that is beside the point. Uh, what is important is that it's not only a static language, so you don't only uh, specify a um, smart contract scenario statically, but you can also um, integrate it with dynamic pieces of code. And actually, uh, we figured out, um, I think a year ago, that no matter how many uh, unit and integration tests we write, we're not going to cover everything. So. Uh, we started building some fuzzers, uh, and which was a great idea because we were able to much more aggressively test, and we discovered a lot of bugs like this. Uh, not many, but the bugs that we found would have been very, very difficult to find otherwise. And uh, the nice thing is that the fuzzers that we've built are actually integrated with Mando, so uh, they they can use bits of uh, pre-written uh, scenarios, pre-written tests, and then mix and merge them, um, and then uh, if something fails, then the fuzzer can also output a full scenario that they can run. You can make it part of your integration test suite. Uh, so this is quite nice and we use it a lot. And then the last two things uh, I want to talk about uh, are um, based on our collaboration with Runtime Verification, uh, which is a very cool company that does uh, a lot of very cool products, especially they do formal modeling of software. Um, which is a very difficult but very very rewarding uh, field, and um, there's two. Actually, there's right now there's two projects we're running with them. Uh, they might get merged at some point. So one of them uh, is a K framework full implementation of our VM. Uh, now, for those who don't know, K framework um, is is a framework that allows one to define languages in a formal way, and is very good at it. Uh, there's many uh, technologies out there that allow people to define um, um, formal specifications, but K-Framework is especially good at defining languages. Um, and uh, they already had, so when we started, they already uh, had an implementation of K-Wasm. Uh, so uh, I think um, uh, Ricard uh, had a presentation about it two years ago at this very, uh, at this very conference. Um, and uh, yeah, we're working with them to integrate that and also formally model uh, the non-WASM part of our VM. So the you know synchronous calls and whatnot, uh, bring them together and then run uh, smart contracts using this um, this formal formally defined version of uh, the VM. So uh, this is executable, uh, which means you can actually execute uh, smart contracts on the K framework implementation. Uh, but it's much more than that. Uh, you can also um, uh, prove things about smart contracts. Uh, you can run all kinds of tools like coverage, um, fuzzers, all kinds of things, uh, which is very cool. Uh, the other um, project that we have with them, uh, we, uh, we have the, our multi-sig contract. This is a contract that allows uh, to have multiple signers on a transaction. And we had it modeled and verified also in K-Framework. And its soundness was proven. Uh, it's, I think the final output of this effort should come out um, this month or so. Uh, so uh, it's actually very close to the end. And um, uh, we also, uh, and yeah, uh, it, it actually found some very subtle bugs. Um, so it, I guess it was worth it. And we're also thinking about integrating the two. Uh, so 
that's also going to be something very interesting to look out for, uh, to having very high level uh, proofs about smart contracts, but also an executable um, sort of a representation of everything that is going on on the blockchain. So there, there we go. And we hope we also will, this will also be available for developers. Right now, it's still a bit experimental and a bit harder to use, but we're planning to release tools that are available for everyone. Um, I'm sure I uh, skipped over several things. Maybe I didn't cover quite everything. Uh, maybe there's some places more in depth where I didn't go, uh, but uh, I'm actually open to a lot of questions and um, yeah. Wow, cool. Thank you so much, Andre. That was a truly awesome talk. I see you have a <laughs> Thank lot you of much. fans there. <laughs> We have a very big community, so I'm, I'm be using this occasion to uh, get a huge shout out to our community out there, to our fans, and all the people who make the magic happen every day. You're, you're amazing. And another cool. great thing about about uh, the um, uh, the Alban community, and uh, I cannot emphasize this enough, um, we're very present on Twitter, but also on Telegram. And the very cool thing is um, we're at this point uh, where a lot of people from community help other people from the community. And I think this is awesome because we're just a bunch of people building this software and we wouldn't be able to reach out and help as many people without the help of, you know, our community uh, also helping themselves. So uh, thank you very much for being so active. Wow, nice, nice. I mean, uh, that's the power of community. That's how we build stuff, right? That's how Web3 Yeah, and, and I think this is, the, this is the magic of blockchain. I think we really might be able to... Um, I mean, the internet is awesome because it brings people together, but I think blockchain has uh, this potential to bring them together even more and to collaborate even more. And uh, this is actually one of the main things that drive me, you know, every day to push forward. Exactly. That's... I mean, blockchain communities are different in, yeah, in that way. They are. They're so like, you know. They really are, yeah. Um, there's a different vibe, which is really, really awesome. It is, um, it is. Thank you so much. So uh, some of the comments loved a lot, a lot of references. Uh, was just yesterday bragging to my colleagues about how cool the rollbacks are. And a lot of claps and, <laughs> and thumbs up to you, Andre. Thank you very much. Uh, and, um, there is a question. This is Sugata from BH Network. Mm -hmm. We'd love to know some details about the gas estimation when uh, when doing a transaction, for example, from a DAP. Uh, what is the best practice for this? Thank you. Uh, now, there's multiple ways to to um, to go around this. Uh, now, of course, for simple transactions, for simple contracts, um, what we do, uh, I mentioned the Mandos test earlier. Uh, so when a developer develops uh, a contract, we'll write the tests, and we also in include gas uh, in those tests. So a developer can get an idea of how much gas it consumes simply just by writing tests. And um, we've had, like for, for many months now, we've had uh, all the tests with real gas, and we try to encourage everyone to write tests with real gas so they get a, can get a feel of how much it consumes. Uh, from time to time... Um, you know, you have a smart contract that consumes a variable amount of gas, which, you know, makes things a bit more complex. Uh, one of the things we can do, we can simulate the transaction before it actually gets executed and then maybe add a 10% on top. So, uh, so it's safe. Um, there's another thing that uh, actually we did. It's a lesser known uh, design pattern, which might become more, more used at some point in the future. So we actually have a few contracts, uh, which sometimes we know there are transactions that can consume a lot of gas, not your regular transactions that everybody um, performs every day, but you know maybe uh, once a week or once a month, an admin comes in and maybe has to do some really big thing, big restructuring in the contract. And so we figured out um, a design pattern where uh, we would um, prematurely stop the execution, save the intermediate state, and then allow the sender to do more transactions until you know enough uh, transactions will will help perform the entire uh, transaction from, from start to finish. And in these cases where the contract is smart and the contract stops early when it feels it's running low on gas, simulation doesn't help very much. So in this case, you have to know. So this is the limit. This many transaction I can, I can, um, I can process. Uh, there's another little caveat there. 
in order uh, for people not to abuse the blockchain, uh, we actually penalize uh, by not returning uh, the leftover gas if the leftover gas is too big. So if like uh, you you gave the transaction like 10 units of gas, but only need the one unit of gas, so you basically wasted, you know, 10, nine slots, then you, we might penalize uh, you and not give you the leftover gas back. So yeah, actually uh, smart uh, gas, uh, gas estimations are quite important. Um, yeah, so there's multiple ways to go around it. Uh, but yeah, simulation for most cases should work fine. Uh, and there's another, again, uh, a slight um, issue that complicates things a bit. Remember I talked a lot about asynchronous calls and callbacks. Of course, uh, the gas estimations are not only for the first transaction that you encounter, but your contract might be calling another contract and then your contract has to estimate how much gas to give it. For asynchronous calls, uh, in, in the simple cases, you usually give it all your gas and okay, fine, whatever, take it all. Uh, but in more, more advanced cases, you might want to make sure that you're giving the right amount of gas to another contract uh, that you make sure that there's always going to be enough gas for the callback, stuff like that. So there's no simple answer. Um, yeah, simulations for the simple cases, for the more complex cases, calibration between the DAP and the smart contract should might be necessary. Okay, I hope that answered it. Okay, I hope we answered uh, your question. And thank you so much. I, I don't see any, any other questions. Thank you again, Andre. People are just like <laughs> sending you, <laughs> the, applauding you from um, virtual our virtual um, audience. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting um, me. And uh, again, uh, to everybody, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Um, and for any more questions, we're available on Telegram pretty much all the time. <laughs> if not us, the community or by email. So thank you and um, have fun <laughs> with the next presentation. Awesome. Have a nice day. <laughs> have, have a nice, nice day, day Andrew.